Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce today's speaker, Tom Sudhoff from uh, Stanford University. Weird. Uh, Tom began uh, his research career in Germany as a medical student working in Göttingen. Um, we worked in the laboratory of Victor Whitaker, where he, introduced, he was introduced to the biochemistry of the brain and synaptic vesicles. His first paper, or at least the first paper I could find on PubMed from him, was from 1983, written as a medical student, where he was exploring the biochemistry of chromaffin granules, the secretory vesicles in adrenal medulla. Quite honestly, I didn't read the paper. I did read the abstract. In, in an inspired move, Tom joined the lab of Mike Brown and Joel Goldstein at UT Southwestern in the early 1980s. Here, Tom cloned the LDL receptor in 1985, and in 1987, he identified the SRE binding site, DNA motif, that confers cholesterol regulation onto the LDL receptor. This was exceptional basic science, and of course, was also of profound clinical significance. Tom stayed on at Southwestern, UT Southwestern, to begin his independent laboratory, and there he returned to his interest from the Whitaker lab as a medical student, this biochemistry of synaptic vesicles. Tom's work in this field has been nothing short of spectacular. Tom and others in the field, including Richard Scheller, Reinhard Jan, as well as Randy Schechtman and Jim Rothman working in non-neuronal systems, worked out the, the biochemistry of vesicle fusion. Now, as you all know, a key feature of secretion of synaptic vesicles is calcium dependence. Tom demonstrated that the synaptic tagman protein, a synaptic vesicle protein that he had purified, was a calcium sensor. He showed that the synaptic tagman protein binds calcium and phospholipid, and through genetic analysis in the mouse, that although the core fusion machinery was still intact in mutants, it was not calcium dependent. He went on to demonstrate that the biochemical mechanism, the, went on to demonstrate the biochemical mechanism by which synaptic tagman catalyzed calcium dependent synaptic release. For Tom's extraordinary contributions in understanding synaptic transmission, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology in 2013. As Tom was dissecting the biochemical basis of synaptic release, he also began on the side to study how synapses were made. Here he discovered synaptic adhesion molecules, proteins that match the pre and postsynaptic membranes. Like his work on vesicle release, Tom's work on the synaptic adhesion molecules has had an enormous impact on the field. This has relied on exquisite biochemistry and detailed genetic analysis. This work has had enormous implications, both for the logic of assembling neural circuits, as well as for important clues to the molecular basis of neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, now I could go on and on about Tom's extraordinary work on adhesion molecules, which I'm a giant fan of, but you came here today here to, to hear Tom speak. And so without further ado, welcome Tom. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Larry, for this generous introduction. Although I'm a little hurt you didn't read my paper. Uh, <laughs> you may have been the first person ever to read that paper. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be here, to be back. I haven't been at UCL for a long time. Actually, I haven't been anywhere for a long time. So, um, uh, and, uh, what I want to do today is talk to you as the title, the revised title of my talk here indicates about the, what I call the molecular logic of synapse formation. And, oops, now how do I get this to work? Can't get to, to work with a clicker, can't get to, to work with, okay, I guess I'm going to have to do it this way. Okay. So, um, so before I tell you about specific projects, let me just remind you that the brain is generally envisioned to function via information transfer and information processing in neural circuits. 
a neural circuits as schematically shown here are composed of neurons that are connected at synapses with each other. And what you see is an electron micrograph of a synapse. And these synapses not only transfer information from one neuron to the next, they actually process that information fundamentally. And different synapses are very different. They process information differentially. They're not only different because they're sometimes excited or inhibitory, but for example, glutamatergic synapses contain at least two types, sometimes three types of receptors, AMPA, NMDA, and kinate receptors that have very different signaling properties. Synapses thus exhibit an amazing diversity and they transfer information and process that information in differential manners. What we are trying to do is to describe the molecular rules that determine the formation and specification of synapses. How is it that synapses form between two different neurons? And how is it that these synapses differ in a somewhat reproducible, although plastic manner? And the fundamental propositions of our work are that synapses are connections that are also intercellular junctions, like other intercellular junctions, but different from any other intercellular junction because they're specialized for transferring and processing information and because they're inherently asymmetric. There's a presynaptic and a postsynaptic neuron that are very, very different. Moreover, the second proposition is that if these junctions, like other intercellular junctions, intercellular adhesion molecules mediate signaling between the two sides, but in this case, it's asymmetric signaling between the pre and post synaptic side. And thereby, these adhesion molecules are the key to understanding, in our view, how synapses work, how they're established in the first place, how they're remodeled, how they're plastic, how their properties are determined. Lots of synaptic adhesion molecules or candidate synaptic adhesion molecules have been described, some of which are shown here. Larry's favorite molecule, I'm afraid, is not on here. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and these molecules fall, fall into a pre and post synaptic classes presynaptic on the left, postsynaptic on the right. What you can see immediately is there's a lot more postsynaptic molecules than the presynaptic molecules. In fact, the presynaptic molecules tend to be more hub molecules, they tend to be in all synapses, excitatory inhibitory, whereas the postsynaptic molecules tend to be specialized for either inhibitory or excitatory. Which of these molecules are actually important? Which ones really do something significant to the synapse? Which ones are bystanders is unclear. And because of that, some years ago, we started out to systematically study these adhesion molecules and try to figure out how these molecules work. And what I'm going to talk about today is not the whole project, but two key projects out of this entire attempt. One which is focuses on neurexins that are presynaptic adhesion molecules, arguably the ones that have the most postsynaptic ligands, validated postsynaptic ligands, that interact with a large number of postsynaptic proteins. And as you will hear, do quite a few different things. And another ones are latrophilins, which are postsynaptic adhesion GPCRs. And I'm gonna to talk to you about them because I think this is the most interesting stuff I can tell you. So um, very uh, logical in some way. So I'm first gonna tell you about neurexins and then about latrophilins. And let me start off by explaining you a bit about neurexins in case you haven't heard enough about them yet which is that neurexins are type, typical, classical type one membrane proteins, but they come in two principal variants, alpha neurexins and beta neurexins. The beta neurexins are basically N-terminally truncated variants of the alpha neurexins that are transcribed from the same genes via independent promoters. There's three genes in mammals. Each one has an independent alpha and beta neurexin promoter. Neurexin 1 also has a gamma neurexin, which I won't discuss. 
The nanoxins are localized to synapses where they form nanoclusters in the synapses. Hundreds, actually thousands of mutations in neurexin genes, generally deletions, have been found in patients with a variety of neuropsychiatric disorders. A subject which I think is very interesting, but which I won't discuss today. What I will talk about, however, to some extent, is the Baroque alternative splicing of neurexins at six canonical sites. And this alternative splicing creates thousands of isoforms, not quite as many as DSCAM, but still quite a few. And these isoforms are differentially distributed in brain, they're highly regulated, and they may or may not be activity dependently regulated, the alternative splicing. And the one particular site of alternative splicing I'm gonna talk about today is called splice site number four, which is shared as seen here by alpha and beta neurexins. And finally, as I already indicated, there are many and very diverse transsynaptic ligands for neurexins. The project I'm gonna to talk to you about focuses on one particular function of neurexins. Many different functions have been described at this point, but I wanna to talk to you about one function that I've been fascinated by over the last years, which is a role in the control of synaptic neurotransmitter receptors. And the question here is how does a synapse know how much how many AMPA and NMDA receptors to put into the postsynaptic site. And what I'm gonna tell you is that neurexins play a key function in determining this question. But this is not how we started this project. We started this project actually in asking what does alternative splicing of neurexins at this particular site do? And we started to ask this question for this particular site because that's the site that's been most studied and that's the site of alternative splicing that is most uh, effective in controlling ligand interactions. So this is basically how we started this. And we started with a genetic experiment. We also love genetics, which is that we changed the genome sequence in the mouse in a manner that alternative splicing could be controlled using Cree recombinase. And specifically as illustrated here, the wild type splice acceptor sequence for the alternatively spliced exon of SS4 is an unusual non-canonical sequence as you can see on top. And we changed that by mutagenesis in vivo into a canonical splice acceptor sequence as shown at the bottom with the red nucleotides. This created a mouse wherein this alternatively spliced exon is no longer alternatively spliced, but always spliced in. It's always in. We also flanked that axon with LOX P sites. So clearly recombinase could make it always LOX taken out. And using this mice then, we can control alternative splicing. It becomes constitutively in or out, depending on whether CRE is there or not. When we analyze neurons and culture from these mice, we had a surprise. And this is illustrated here in that AMPA receptor mediated EPSCs were significantly decreased in the neurexin 3 SS4 plus case. And I forgot to mention, we did this first for neurexin 3. The other neurexins come later. So when we did this for neurexin 3, we found that the SS4 plus suppressed AMPA receptor mediated responses compared to the SS4 minus, the same mouse, same culture, just with Cree all compared to an unrelated wild type control shown here in a black bar. But NMDA receptor dependent EPSCs were normal as were IPSCs. This was surprising because this is the signature of a postsynaptic phenotype neurexins were supposed to be presynaptic. And it was surprising because it suggested that neurexins control the postsynaptic AMPA receptor response. We've confirmed this with a number of additional experiments that I won't discuss today. It has been published almost 10 years ago, demonstrating that indeed the expression of the SS4 plus neurexin 3 caused a loss of postsynaptic amber receptors from the synapse. So this raised then the question, does it really act presynaptically as postulated 
And if so, does alternative splicing in a physiological context actually control the uh, glutamate receptor content? And to do this, we use the preparation that we use quite often, whereby we inject intermice at P21, as shown here, in the CA1 region viruses, AAVs that either express query recombinase or a mutant query recombinase, a control, both tagged with EGFP, so this is why it's green. And then a couple of weeks later, we cut slices and we perform electrophysiology. And as you can see here, when we stimulate the axons emanating from the CA1 region and we record from the subiculum, which is the major output area for the CA1 region axons, we can record from a synapse that is in which only the presynaptic neuron was manipulated. The postsynaptic neuron is unchanged. And this preparation allows analysis of specifically presynaptic effects on synaptic strength and plasticity. And what we found in a nutshell is that we could completely reproduce the phenotype that we observed in culture, and that there was a suppression of amber receptor mediated responses measured in input output curves in order to control for potential artifacts of, electro of stimulating electrode placements com and compared to both the SS CRE uh, to the presynaptic CRE. What this means, in other words, is that if you splice out presynaptic SS4 in your exon 3, you return the suppression of amber receptors in the CA1, uh, in the postsynaptic neurons in the subiculum back to normal, as shown here. And this basically demonstrates that the presynaptic neurexon controls the postsynaptic amper receptor content. Again, no effect on NMDA receptor mediated responses. As I alluded to earlier, this was done in neurexin 3. Neurexins are highly homologous, and so we thought the other neurexins would do the same thing, and maybe the remaining amper receptor response that was we saw here might be dependent on the co-expression of other neurexins in the same synapses. It was actually very hard to convince a postdoc to pursue analysis of other neurexins in the same synapse because the expectation was that it would be the same story. When I finally could convince Jinya Dai to actually study these mice that we generated that have the same mutation in neurexin one and neurexin two, she found a very surprising result, namely that now the amper receptor responses were perfectly normal in the SS4+. Plus. But instead, NMDA receptor responses were enhanced, not suppressed, enhanced. And this again is done in the same preparation. These are presynaptic effects and postsynaptic receptor responses. SS2, uh, neurexin 2, SS4, conditional knock in mice, no phenotype in this particular synapse, at this particular paradigm. So the surprising conclusions is then that the three neurexins are actually intrinsically very different, despite the homology, that in both cases, presynaptic SS4 alternative splicing regulates the postsynaptic glutamate receptor response, but in opposite directions for different receptor types. This suggests a mechanism of transsynaptic receptor control, which indicates one potential avenue to how at a synapse, a presynaptic neuron can tell the postsynaptic cell what kinds of receptors to put into a particular synapse. And it obviously begs the question of how does this actually work? What is the mechanism here? Which is what I'm gonna talk about now. We think so. We tested the specific reconstitution. Well, it's not a reconstitution. Uh, we basically overexpressed just beta, and it has the same effect. So you can act beta as a dominant negative or dominant positive, depending on how you NMDA or AMPA, you know, X and one or three. So beta does work because beta is expressed much lower than alpha in the CA1 neurons. I suspect alpha and beta work in the same way in the synapse. Yes but we've never overexpressed alpha. Okay, so how does this work? 
As you can see here, neurexins interact with a large number of postsynaptic ligands, but there's only one ligand that binds only to SS4 plus and never to SS4 minus. All others in various splice variants and isoforms bind either only to SS4 minus or to SS4 plus, plus SS4 minus. So, and that ligands are cerebellans, which are secreted proteins that are broadly expressed in brain, despite their name, and have been studied by others extensively over the years. Now, these cerebellans are C1Q domain proteins that bind to neurexins and also bind to postsynaptic receptors and thereby form adapters between the presynaptic neurexins and the postsynaptic site. So we generated conditional cerebellin two knockout mice because in the cerebiculum and hippocampus, cerebellin one isn't expressed. Actually, cerebellin four is expressed only in interneurons. And measured synapse numbers first because traditionally and the people who pub, who study cerebellans, they always think that it has something to do with synapse numbers because the cerebellum one mutant has a loss of synapses from the cerebellum. No change in synapse numbers, which actually replicates previous experiments that we had done in other brain regions. We then went on and studied synaptic transmission in these cerebellum conditional knockout mice. And what we found is illustrated in this slide using input output curves, again, from the subiculum synapses, same preparation I told you earlier, an amazing phenotype to us, at least amazing in that there was an increase in ample receptor media responses and the suppression in NMDA receptor media responses. One molecule, both effects. This is a synthetic effect then of both manipulations that I showed you previously, except the opposite. It's a loss of function. This suggested to us that cerebellums mediate the effect of neurexins on the postsynaptic receptor composition. The question obviously arose, maybe these are different synapses, one for ample receptors, one for NMDA receptors that are formed on the same postsynaptic neurons. So address this question we use minimal stimulation, which is thought to isolate individual synapses. These are noisy experiments, but as you can see, even at individual synapses using minimal stimulation paradigms, there's the same effect. Increases in ample receptor responses, decreases in NMDA receptor responses. So cerebellum regulates both ample and NMDA receptors at individual synapses. How does this work? How can we think about this? Now, I mentioned already earlier that cerebellums act to bind to postsynaptic receptors. It turns out that of the four cerebellans, cerebellans one and two bind to receptors that are called glue Ds, which are actually homologous to AMP and NMDA receptors, where cerebellin four binds only to neogenin and DCC, which is a totally different type of molecule. So these cerebellans, cerebellin three is not expressed. So, um, so these cerebellans have two different classes of receptors, but cerebellin one and two bind to to one particular set of molecules called GLUD1 or GLUR delta one or GRID1 and GRID2 that are the only known postsynaptic receptors for these cerebellans. And so we deleted GLUD1 to test whether they are actually involved. We used CRISPR, time goes on. We first measured synapse density again, not surprisingly, no change. It's always the same for us. What about synaptic function? This was done in cultured hippocampal neurons, CRISPR deletions. GLUD1 is the dominant isoform in these neurons. Same phenotype as with the cerebellin 2 deletion. So same effect. So this suggests then that there's a pathway whereby presynaptic neurexins bind to cerebellin 1 and 2, primarily 2 in the synapse, which then binds to GLUD to regulate AMP and MDA receptors. And this is outlined here where the SS4 plus exclusively, not the SS4 minus, regulates the NMD and AMP receptors by binding to the same intermediate. Now this is puzzling. How can two different neuroaxons regulate two different types of receptors in opposite ways via interacting with the same receptor adapter pair? How is that possible? 
I can't give you a conclusive answer to this question, but we came up with a hypothesis that GLUD1 must be transducing distinct neuroxin signals. And that as a signaling receptor, this most likely happens via cytoplasmic effectors. And so we tested the effects of mutation in cytoplasmic GLUD1 sequences on the regulation of NMDA and AMPA receptors by presynaptic neurexins. We identified five conserved sequences in the cytoplasmic domains of GLUD1. These are shown schematically here on the left. We then used the mutations in GLUD1 that individually mutate these sequences as outlined on the left and analyzed the ability to rescue the GLUD1 knockout that was produced by CRISPR. What you can see here on the left is again, when you knock out GLUD1, you get an increase in AMPA receptors because you de-repress the, cere uh, de -repress the cerebellum de uh, immediated suppression. Only one mutant doesn't rescue. All the others rescue. When you look at NMDA receptors, you see the same thing again. GLUD1 now suppresses NMDA receptor response because it takes away the neurexin one cerebellum signal. Again, only one mutant doesn't rescue. Interestingly, the mutants that don't rescue are different, meaning that there are different sequences in the cytoplasmic tail that are essential for the signal transduction. These changes correspond to changes in the surface levels of AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors, suggesting that what happens here is that the GLUD1 cerebellum 2 complex receives differential signaling from either neurexin 1 or neurexin 3 to regulate either AMPA receptor or NMDA receptor content on the cell surface in the synapse. As I already mentioned, GLUD1 is structurally similar to AMPA and MDA receptors. It's a glutamate receptor. It looks like a glutamate receptor. And in fact, there's a spontaneous mouse mutant that, in which it acts almost like a glutamate receptor. Um, so how then does GLUD1 work? Is this telling us something? Does GLUD1 operate by a conformational change in the transmembrane domain? Because AMPA and MDA receptors, as you well know, they gate by a trans... Glutamate binding changes their transmembrane domain to open the channel. So to test this question, we made a simple construct that is illustrated here, whereby we replace the entire transmembrane regions as well as the glutamate binding sequences of GLUD1 with just the transmembrane region of CD4 and a bit of extracellular sequence. In this minimal construct, the only glue D sequences that are still there are the N-terminal domain that binds to cell balance and the full cytoplasmic tail. Surprisingly, these constructs completely rescued both the NMDA and the AMPA receptor phenotype of the glue D1 knockout. We did the same construct for glue D2 as shown here. And again, GLUD2 rescued as well as that construct from GLUD2. So in other words, the transmembrane architecture is an evolutionary vestige. It's something that was left over, presumably. It's irrelevant. You can take it out. Just works fine. All you need is the cerebellum binding site and the cytoplasmic tail of GLUD1 or GLUD2. So this then raises the next question whether the same cytoplasmic GLUD1 sequences mediate regulation of AMPA and MDA receptors. Is it the same sequences that are required? We first made mutants in the sequences and confirmed that they are required. And then we went ahead and made a minimal, minimal construct where this minimal construct I already showed you now carries a cytoplasmic tail that contains only a few amino acids from the GLUD1 one tail. Just a few of them, those amino acids were mutated in the initial experiments. And these are illustrated here. And you can see in red, the amino acids that we put in there. And we also put mutants of these amino acids in there just to make sure 
that we are not um, that we can actually um, have a proper control. When we analyze these, we found that looking at amper receptors in the GLUD1 knockout, the minimal minimal constructs don't didn't rescue except for one construct that contained motif 4A. All the other constructs didn't rescue. But the one construct with motif 4A containing five amino acids or so was fully able to rescue. When we looked at MDA receptors, again, you see the suppression in the knockout, only one construct, a different motif, of course, rescues. The others don't. So this then suggests that it's only a very short sequence in the GLUD1 molecule that mediates the regulation here. And to summarize this, it's this five amino acid sequence for the NMDA receptor on top and the five amino acid sequence of motif 4A for the AMPA receptors that rescues, suggesting that these must be binding sites for some cytoplasmic factors, but which I don't know. There nothing is known about any factors that bind to this despite decades of work on GLUDES. No binding proteins for these particular sequences were ever identified. So to summarize this part of my talk, what I've tried to tell you is about a mechanism whereby presynaptic neurexins, in turn controlled by alternative splicing, regulate postsynaptic receptor content in a manner that two different neurexins regulate two different postsynaptic receptors, AMPA versus NMDA receptors, via the same receptor adapter protein complexes, but presumably via distinct signaling pathways. We don't know the signaling pathways at this point. We do know, however, that alternative splicing of the neurexins is differentially regulated. Neurexins one and three are not coordinately alternatively spliced at splice set four. They're differentially spliced in different ways in different cells. There's also indication that their alternative splicing is regulated by activity, although that's less clear. Suggesting that by this mechanism, a presynaptic neuron can tune the postsynaptic receptor response. This is just one function of neurexin signaling. Neurexins do lots of other things that I haven't discussed, but I always like to illustrate this with the Swiss Army knife model, which I've been using for this purpose for a while now. A Swiss Army knife is basically a platform. And we think that neurexins are signaling platforms. They're signaling platforms with various features that interact with different postsynaptic ligands and that do a lot of different things in synapses. Most of the mechanisms involved are as yet unclear, but you can see that at the same time, this is incredibly simple and incredibly complicated. It's incredibly simple because what I've told you is that one class of neurexins that are homologous, one class of molecules, neurexins that are homologous regulate another class of, of molecules that are also homologous by the same mechanisms in the sense that they're all regulated by total splicing and cell balance too, but by differential effects, suggesting a divergence, if you want, of the regulatory pathway on the background of a very simple fundamental process. What I wanna go on now and talk to you about in the next part of my talk is about latrofinance, which is a completely different uh, adhesion molecule at synapse, a postsynaptic molecule. And I wanna do that because first of all, I think these data are interesting. We are captivated ourselves by the problem of trying to understand the signaling that goes on postsynaptically that creates synapses but also because it serves, I think, to describe to you sort of a contrast between what the whole new action story in that here we are having a postsynaptic adhesion GPCR. GPCRs are basically, I think, the paradigm of cellular signal that is crucial for synapse formation. So what are latrofilins? 
The adhesion GPCRs and adhesion GPCRs have a canonical structure that is shown here. They have a large extracellular sequence usually composed of multiple interaction domains. They then have two sets of domains that define them as adhesion GPCRs. A gain domain shown here in green and the typical GPCR seven transmembrane region domain. And finally, they generally have variable large cytoplasmic tails. And a number of people, labs have worked on this, whose names are shown at the bottom. Okay. In terms of latrophilins, they form, conform to this general design. And what's particularly noticeable here is the gain domain, which defines adhesion GPCRs, because that's really what differentiates them from other GPCRs. And this gain domain is an autoproteolytic domain. It's a domain that mediates autoproteolysis. In a project that we did with Axel Brunger more than 10 years ago, we crystallized this domain, and we found that in this domain as shown here, there are two subdomains, a helical yellow and a beta sandwich magenta domain. And the cleavage site is embedded in this beta sandwich, as you can see here, in a manner that the blue remaining N terminus that goes to the seven transmembrane region remains stuck and doesn't spontaneously come off. Why that is? Nobody knows. But one theory that's very popular is that what happens is that these adhesion GPCRs function by pulling off the gain domain, thereby creating a free end terminus that then serves as a tethered agonist for the GPCR. And there's tremendous evidence in support of this hypothesis. So this is the um, so-called Stachel hypothesis Stachel in German means basically, I don't know, sticko, the right word, something that sticks out, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> can practice my German. Um, <laughs> so, in terms of the adhesion domains of latrophilins, they bind with very high affinities, nanomolar affinities, to two sets of molecules via different domains. By an N-terminal lectin-like domain, they bind to tenuins, which are large adhesion molecules that I'll talk about in a bit. Nanomolar affinities, all, all autophilins, three genes, bind to all tenuins, four genes. They also bind by an olfactomedin-like domain to flirts, which are loose and rich repeat proteins. And both of these interactions mediate transcellular adhesion interactions between any cell that expresses them. Latrophilins were actually discovered and purified originally by two of my former postdocs as proteins that bind to alpha latrotoxin. And because alpha latrotoxin, which also was the source of discovery of norexins, ironically, are presynaptic toxins. They were thought to be presynaptic. And when we started looking into their function, we also started off with the idea that they would be presynaptic. We generated conditional knockout mice and we studied these knockout mice first in culture and then in vivo. And in the very initial studies of these knockout mice, when we studied them in culture, and when we use sparse coast transfections to delete the latrophilin, in this case, latrophilin 2, in only a subset of neurons, thus analyzing postsynaptic effects, we found a dramatic phenotype, namely a very large loss of synapses, as illustrated here in a loss of spines. This was accompanied by a decrease in synaptic transmission and a decrease in synapse density suggesting that postsynaptic latrophilin is essential for a subset of these synapses in cultured neurons, 
And because of this phenotype, which is the most severe genetic phenotype we have observed in any mammalian genetic manipulation, not RNA I, where we always see God knows, but in a genetic manipulation, um, we became very interested in trying to understand how this works. Hmm. Didn't realize this was cut off, I don't know. Okay, so based on this, these results, we initiated a comprehensive analysis of latophilin 2 and latophilin 3 in vivo in the hippocampus. We haven't analyzed latophilin 1 yet. Using conditional knock in mice expressing epitope tag proteins. And what we found is shown here in the hippocampus in that these two latrophilins that are analyzed here, latrophilin 2 and latrophilin 3, as shown in left in the overview and in the quantifications on the right, are differentially distributed in the hippocampus. In that, in the CA1 region, latrophilin 2 is almost exclusively shown here in green in the stratum lacrimosa moleculare, whereas latrophilin 3 is almost exclusively in the stratum orients and radiatum. And when you look at what this corresponds to in terms of circuits, and I have to apologize, I didn't realize all these slides were cut off at the bottom, so you don't, can't see the references and the text, so my apologies. So what this corresponds to is that in the hippocampal circuit as shown here, in this, dia, in this illustration picked from Wikipedia, the source of our wisdom, um, in this very, very simplified uh, <coughs> circuit, um, that the location of latrophilin 2 corresponds to the inputs from the entorhinal cortex, whereas the location of the latrophilin 3 corresponds to the input from the Schafer Sh collateral CA3 region neurons, indicating that this postsynaptic latrophilins that are co expressed in the same neuron are targeted to distinct synapses within these circuits. So this raises the question whether this corresponds to distinct functions in these locations. And to analyze this, we again used in vivo manipulations, this time focused on CA1 parameter neurons as the postsynaptic neurons, one upstream from the hypsubiculum. When we knocked out in the CA1 regions, slatophilin 2, what we found is illustrated in this slide here, which is an input output curves. There was actually an enhancement of Schafer collateral synaptic responses, but a suppression, a loss of entorhinal cortex inputs. And this was correlated with a loss of spines selectively in the stratum lacrimosum molecular and a loss of synapses in the stratum lacrimosum molecular. In contrast, when we do the same experiment for latrophilin 3, what we find is a loss of the Shava collateral inputs, both functionally and morphologically. And in this case, no change, not an increase in the entorhinal cortex inputs. So there's a correspondence of localization and function. These experiments, by the way, were performed with sparse postsynaptic deletions, again, buttressing the point that these are postsynaptic molecules that operate in the same postsynaptic neurons, but in different synapses. So this led us to conclude that these two different latrophilins act in different synapses as postsynaptic adhesion molecules that are essential for the formation and or maintenance of these input synapses. That there's something fundamentally different about them in the sense of which synapse they act in, but that they are the same in the sense that they are required for these synapses to operate. In the last bit, I want to talk about the molecular mechanism. Again, these studies are by no means complete, but I think we've made some progress in trying to understand how latrophilins work. And the specific questions here are, given that latrophilins have two different ligands at least, flirts and tenuants, and given that they're GPCRs, do they transduce ligand signals? And do they function as GPCRs in synapse formation? Cut off here, sorry about that. And so to address these questions, 
we performed rescue experiments. And we first analyzed the effect of mutations that block specific ligand interactions. In these same initial experiments, we also analyzed the mutation that blocks the autoproteolysis. And what you see here is one mutation, point mutation based on the crystal structure that we obtained in collaboration with them at Arax lab, whereby a binding of flirts is blocked. Another mutation where we simply delete the lectin-like domain, no tenurin binding, and a third mutation where there is no autoproteolysis. And then we use these mutations in rescue experiments, but we first showed in adhesion experiments that these molecules are fully capable of other adhesions, except for the one which they're not supposed to do because of the mutations. I'm not gonna go into these adhesion assays in detail. They're done with hex cells and you can see that sometimes there's these aggregates and sometimes they aren't. And that corresponds to the mutations and the binding of the various pairs. You can also see that there is no adhesion between tenurins themselves or between um, flirts themselves alone. So the constructs thus enable rescue experiments. We first performed these in culture. We found, as shown here, using measurements of synapse density or measurements of the MEPSC frequency on the right, that Obviously, the deletion in this case of lactofilin 3 caused a decrease in synapse numbers and an MEPSC frequency. When you reintroduce wild type lactofilin 3, it rescues it. Neither one of the ligand binding mutants rescued. There was a slight trend for the tenurin ligand binding mutant, but it wasn't very compelling. However, somewhat surprisingly to me, the autoproteolysis mutant fully rescued as shown here on the right and light green, which is something we're still trying to pursue because it's puzzling. We then went ahead and asked, why do you potentially need both binding sites for flirts and for tenurins to get rescued? Can this be reproduced in vivo? And so we performed rescue experiments in vivo using stereotactic manipulations followed by electrophysiology. And the bottom line is, as shown here in Schaffer collateral synapses, lateral 3 uh, knockouts rescues, that neither one of the ligand binding mutants rescues, only the wild type rescues, suggesting you need both binding sites for function. It's so somewhat surprising. To test this conclusion with an independent method, we use retrograde rabies virus tracing. This explains the method. I'm sure you're all familiar with it because many people use this, but the bottom line here is that you have a starter cell shown here in red, and you basically map all the presynaptic inputs to the starter cell. And what we found in such measurements, as you would expect, CA1 gets equal amounts of inputs from the IPSI and contralateral CA3 region. And in addition, gets a much lower numbers of inputs from the entorhinal cortex, but only the ipsilateral cortex. So this allows mapping bilateral inputs and can be used to test the postsynaptic function. And when we did this as shown here, for lateral 3, we basically see the same results as we did in the electrophysiology. The knockout blocks inputs, actually in this case, the majority is measured with this approach of CA1, of CA3, both sides, IPSI and contralateral, has no effect on entorhinal cortex. This is rescued with wild type lateral 3, but not with either ligand binding mutant. So collectively, these results suggest the possibility that a transsynaptic interaction network drives synapse formation in a manner where you need both ligands, either on the same postsynaptic or on separate postsynaptic molecules. As illustrated here, which is taken from a paper from Demet Arax lab with which we collaborated, on which we collaborated, which shows you the lateral here in brown 
gain domain is the bottom next to the seven transmembrane regions, the two different domains, olfactomedon and lectin-like domain, the flirt and the tenuin. We know that they can all form a complex at the same time. And thus this forms a compact protein network since as it turns out, both tenuins and flirts are dimers, resulting in some kind of presumably network-like structure that is essential for a subset of cytotic synapses. A prerequisite of this model is that tenuins are presynaptic adhesion molecules, but we don't actually know this. So we went ahead and localized tenuins using an antibody that was graciously provided to us by my colleague, Li Chen Lu. And what we found with this antibody to tenuin three is that at least a sizable subset of tenuin molecules is in the synapse in a mature brain. This shows storm super resolution microscopy pictures, double labeled for bassoon on top or homer at the bottom, one a presynaptic, the other one a postsynaptic marker and for tenuin. And you can see that in both cases, there's a nanocluster of tenuins within the active, within the synaptic cleft. This suggests that tenuins are at least partly in the synapse directly there, although it doesn't tell you whether they're pre or post synaptic. It does, however, sort of extend the paradigm that we had previously observed for neurexins, whereby tenuins are also nanoclusters. They don't just fill the site. They're in a cluster within the synapse and which may or may not correspond to nanocolumns. I don't know that because sometimes a synapse can have more than one cluster and it sort of emerges more and more that most synapses only have a single nanocolumn. So this may or may not be the same. So that supports the model, but for those of you who are familiar with this field, you may know that there's lots of papers out there that conclude that tenuins bind to each other across the cell, intercellularly, homophilically, and that that mediates, in fact, specificity of cellular interactions, such as synapse specificity. There's a large literature that suggests that homophilic interactions between tenuins mediate uh, formation of specific synaptic connections, but none of these papers actually specifically deleted either pre or post synaptic tenurin and tested this conclusion. One paper from uh, my colleague again, Li Chen Lu, said did this, but they mapped axonal projections via imaging in a manner that is very difficult to control because it totally depends on the angle of the sectioning. They didn't actually map synaptic connectivity. So we set out to do that because for the purpose of trying to understand how tenurins actually work as high affinity ligands of latrophilins, we needed to know whether they are presynaptic and postsynaptic functionally, or whether they're only pre or only postsynaptic functionally. And we did this by using, again, stereotactic manipulations in double conditional knockout mice for tenuins three and four, which are not the only, but the major tenuins expressed in the hippocampal formation. And what we found is that if you knocked out postsynaptic tenuin three and four in the CA1 region, as shown here, and we looked at the synaptic connectivity by rabies virus tracing, there was no phenotype whatsoever. The connections were perfectly normal there was not a hint of a functional deficit. Now, this doesn't exclude the possibility of a other type of tenuin function postsynaptically that may manifest in a change in synaptic transmission in synaptic connectivity that is maybe these synapses exist and can be traced by rabies virus, but they just don't work. So we measured electrophysiology using measurements of both Schaffer collaterals and enteroanal cortex inputs, no effect whatsoever. So clearly for those types of connections, and this is only for these types of connections, not for all connections in the brain, 
tenuance are postsynaptically expandable. What about presynaptic deletions? We devised a method to map presynaptic deletions using postsynaptic rabies virus tracing. This enables measuring, however, only one input at a time. So we measured the presynaptic input from the entorhinal cortex in this case. When we did the presynaptic entorhinal cortex deletions of tenurins and then looked at the inputs by rabies virus tracing from CA3, there was no phenotype. But we didn't manipulate CA3. When we looked at, CA, at the entorhinal cortex inputs, presynaptic tenurin deletions have a massive impairment decrease. So tenurins are required here presynaptically. To measure, test this with an independent method, we again used electrophysiology. These are the entorhinal cortex inputs. You can see that there is the same massive phenotype as with rabies virus tracing, not surprising. If you have fewer synapses, you're gonna have fewer synaptic responses. Moreover, although the NMDA and AMPA receptor composition of the synapse is unchanged, as you can see here in D and E, the remaining synapses do have a change in paired pulse ratio, which basically means that they have a change in release probability, in this case, a decrease in release probability. So in other words, presynaptic deletions of tenuins in this synapse has a massive effect on the number of synapses and their functionality. Postsynaptic deletions in CA1 has no effect whatsoever on synaptic connectivity, either for CI3 inputs or for entorhinal cortex inputs. So back to the main question then, given that this supports the notion that tenurin binding is an essential component of latrofilin function, the way how we think about it then is that there's possible coincidence signaling via multiple ligands as a mechanism of circuit assembly. The idea here is, in other words, that you need both binding sites in order to activate latrofilins. Although at this point, we don't actually know how that would mechanistically work. In particularly, we are puzzled by the fact that latrofilin autoproteolysis doesn't seem to be, to, by all indications, essential. So we turned to the question then, given that latrophilins are GPCRs or look like GPCRs, are they really GPCRs? Do they function in synapse formation as GPCRs? And these are my last bits of data. So bear with me for a few more moments. We again made mutants. We made a series of mutants that test the C-terminal parts of latrophilins. One in which we put a GPI anchor onto the extracellular domains. There's no TMRs very brutal. The other one is to insert T4 lysozyme into the third cytoplasmic loop, which blocks G protein and arrestin binding. And finally, a deletion of the cytoplasmic tail. We use these mutants in rescue experiments, but I'm going to focus on the mildest one, the least dramatic of these mutations, the one where we insert a T4 lysozyme, which is a common mutation for studies of GPCRs. Surface binding, transport and ligand binding are not impaired in these mutations. I'm not gonna go into this in detail because the time is late. Let me just say that it doesn't matter if you have a GPCR activity or if you have a cytoplasmic tail for the protein to actually get into spines. To ensure that the T4L insertion actually blocks GPCR activity and to measure GPCR activity. We used hex cells that we transfected with wild type and mutant latrofilin 2 and latrofilin 3. And then we measured the cyclic MP levels in these cells using Flamindo 2 fluorescence imaging or using putting kinase A activity shown here on the left and the right. What you can see is latrofilin 2 or 3 overexpression in itself dramatically increases both cyclic MP levels and putting kinase A activity, confirming work of others 
demonstrating that adhesion GPCRs often have a strong intrinsic activity. You can also see that when you look at Latofilin 2, that the Latofilin 2 T4 lysozyme insertion blocks this effect. In these experiments, in a subset of samples, we co-transfected PDE7B, which is a phosphodiesterase that hydrolyzes cyclic AMP and serves as a negative control. Latofilin 3 had the same signature. Whenever you insert a T4L that blocks G and arrestin binding, you block the activity. So this enables us to test the role of GPCR signaling for latrofilin function. We first did this in culture, synapse density. When you block latrofilin GPCR function activity, you block rescue. Not surprisingly, if you just take out all the transmembrane regions or the cytoplasmic tail, you achieve the same result, block of rescue. What about in vivo? I'm gonna go through this rather quickly. We did this both for latrofilin two and latrofilin three. What you can see here is latrofilin two. Latrofilin two is specific for entorhinal cortex inputs. There's no phenotype in Schafer collateral inputs. For the perforant path stimulation, you can see that the knockout decreases the input, wild type rescues. The GPCR mutant doesn't rescue. Latrofilin 3, same thing for Schaffer collaterals because that's what Latrofilin 3 is specific for. Perforant path, no phenotype. So finally, rabies virus tracing as an alternative approach to make sure. <laughs> and basically the same result. What you see here for Latrofilin 3 is again, Ipsy and contralateral CA3 region, there's a massive phenotype with the deletion of latrofilin 3 rescued with wild type, not with a mutant, no phenotype in the entorhinal cortex inputs. So what I've told you in this second part of my presentation is that ligand binding to latrofilins is essential for their function in synapses that this function involves the formation and or maintenance or both of synapses. I actually don't think we can really distinguish between formation and maintenance. In fact, I think that synapses, synaptic selectivity, one mechanism may very well be instability, a lack of basically that synapses form at random, but that they not only need to be stabilized. So that is, something that needs to be explored. GPCR activation is essential. There's a basic activity that's quite strong. And then that then leads to a normal number of synapses with a normal function. Latrofilins are only obviously one set of molecules that are essential here. There's others as well. If and how ligand binding regulates GPCR activity remains a major open question given the puzzling result that we've had with the gain domain mutations that need further exploration. So I uh, thank you all for sticking around 10 minutes. And <laughs> what I've tried to tell you this is very different pictures, very different molecules, very different networks, very different functions. I refer to them as nanomachines because all of these involve probably stable protein-protein interactions. These are high affinity interactions. These are complexes that operate continuously. They need to be there. They're not just doing development. These nanomachines have distinct roles within regulating synapses. How a synapse as a bigger micro machine is assembled from nanomachines is obviously at this point still unclear. I think there is a prospect of patching this together, at least in terms of the cell biology. If we cut through some more of this clutter, but I also think that there is an inherent complexity to any biological system that we need to acknowledge and we can't just expect that things will be as simple as having one molecule 
basically be the steering wheel of the whole apparatus. Let me close by acknowledging the key drivers of these projects that I discussed with you. Virginia Dai was in recent years the key experimenter and experimental designer and interpreter of the Nurexen experiments, building on pioneering work that was, came particularly from Jason Aoto, who is now at the University of Colorado. And Rick Sando and Xu Chen Zhang did all of the recent work on latrophilins and tenurins that I discussed, building on the work of Garrett Anderson, who really started this project. Thank you very much for your patience. We have some questions. Oh, wait, so I think I have to bang this twice. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. Um, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, so, do you think the concentration of cerebellums in the synapse are always saturating? And why is it not a regulatory mechanism? And how do you know that when NMDA receptors change, that it's not a balance between synaptic and extrasynaptic, and that all that fluid does is change the lateral diffusion of alpha and beta? So those are great questions. We don't know the concentration of cell balance. No idea. Um, I don't know if they're saturating. Um, I don't know whether the limiting factor here is cell balance or the levels of the SS4 plus minus plus variants of neurexins. We know that there is, so the current dominant model for the regulation of AMP and NMDA receptors that you will read in textbooks is that they are recruited reversibly into synaptic specializations and diffuse in and out. That is primarily based on imaging from overexpressed proteins. That may very well be true. I don't know if it's true or not, but I do know that when we do these manipulations and we puff on AMP or NMDA and then measure the quantity of response that is independent of the synaptic localization that we see exactly the same change. In other words, this is a way of monitoring surface receptors as opposed to um, synaptic receptors, which you do with the synaptic responses. And you see exactly the same. So I didn't show the data because of time, but uh, it has exactly the same output, suggesting that if there is a lateral diffusion out of the synaptic junction, which I think is likely, that then the receptors are internalized afterwards. So is the uh, alternative splicing of neurexin regulated by uh, neuronal activity? Yeah, that's a great question. There's several papers that show this. Some of these papers are compelling, but others we've tried to reproduce and can. So I always escape this by saying that there's papers that claim that this is the case, yes. but. Um, <laughs> You know, what's interesting about this alternative splicing of neurexins is that it sets in very early when neuronal cell types are specified during development. They acquire a characteristic splicing patterns relatively early in development. So if there is changes in alternative splicing, that could be still there, but clearly a lot of it is development cell type specific as well. What is also interesting is that data from transcriptomics, such as done by my green book, shows that cell balance are actually activity dependent. So their expression, their levels goes way up. For example, there's a beautiful paper from the Greenberg lab showing that you have gene expression changes in the visual cortex as a function of, um, of visual inputs. And one of the major genes is cell balance two, and another one is cell balance four. 
Yes, um, my question is similar to the other ones in that um, is something like something with learning and relearning. Certainly, there's a lot of plasticity that goes on in this in the hippocampus in different areas. Um, the entorhinal cortical inputs versus the shaver collaterals, and so um, I was wondering, do you think that this this regulation could could work throughout the lifetime, just like hippocampus is important throughout the lifetime, and then in other cases like. Um, uh, uh, hibernation, you know, 90% of the synapses go away and then they come back at the waking up. Would this be perhaps a place to start looking at these questions of regulation across? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think there is a lot of potential for synaptic plasticity there. And I couldn't agree more that under these conditions, there must be these must play a role the question is rather where is the point of operation okay is it in the alternative splicing of new accents which i would love but <laughs> may not be the case <laughs> is it in the expression of cell balance which i think is quite well established is it actually in the expression of glue d's which for which there's also evidence so that is i think uh, all possible. And, yeah. um, this is really beautiful work. And I want to ask about the more complex possibility to follow up on your idea of whether the mechanism will be simple. So glue B1 expression is actually quite high in astrocytes. Do you think there could be this in where I'm sorry? In astrocytes? Mm -hmm. Do you think there could be this indirect from presynaptic to astrocytes to postsynaptic? <clears throat> yes, absolutely. So we haven't in these projects explored the role of glue D's in astrocytes. Uh, it's absolutely conceivable um, that so the knockout that we did with glue D's would also knock it out in astrocytes. There's no question about that. Um, we haven't done, uh, but we have done sparse deletions in neurons in vivo of glue D. And in this case, we do see the same phenotype. So that doesn't exclude a role for astrocytes. We are intensely studying right now the potential role of norexin-1 in astrocytes because norexin-1 has also high levels of expression in astrocytes. And there is a role that's complementary to that of norexin-1 in neurons, um, but it's different. And so, um, at this point, all bets are on. <laughs> Hi, uh, this might be a naive question. I was, I was just still trying to understand like uh, how the same signaling molecule can give two different effects. And I try to understand that too. <laughs> uh, I'm with you there. <laughs> could directions, different um, isotypes of neurexins be binding direct have physical interaction with the glue D1 that could inform of uh, the different neurons that are interact. Yes. Um, so our hypothesis, unvalidated, is that Sabellan 2 has differential affinities for neurexin 1 and 3, based on beautiful data from the machina lab in the literature. And that that differential affinity, we've discussed this earlier, is what is essential here for the differential effects. To test this hypothesis, we actually performed experiments that I haven't had time to discuss, where we put the alternatively spliced sequence, SS4 sequence of neurexin 1 into neurexin 3, and of neurexin 3 into neurexin 1, which is supposed to change their affinities although we haven't measured this to our embarrassment. Um, and when we did this, we re-specified neurexin 1, which became neurexin 3, and neurexin 3, which became neurexin 1. So this short 30 amino acid alternatively spliced sequence, which by the way, is the least conserved sequence between the neurexins. So there's the most divergence was sufficient to impart specificity 
I need somebody to measure affinities. That's been a problem to find someone who's willing to measure affinity. So let's take two more questions. One from the chat. So, uh, all right, from Isfahan Modi. Are, are there any behavioral cognitive or learning and memory consequences of the uh, lactophilin or tenurin deletions? Yes, they are. I mean, not surprisingly, if you knock it out like latrophilin too in the endoranal cortex, these mice have problems specifically. They have cognitive flexibility, relearning problems. Yeah, they do. I mean, as you would expect. Yeah. Vincent, did you have a question? Yeah, I actually have a question. Uh, it's a fascinating genetic study. So I was just wondering um, across different kinds of assets, you have different genetic mosaics, uh, you know, across, you know, a heterologous synapse assay. You know what, Vincent, let me give you a, yeah. because nobody's going to hear you back. <laughs> So sorry. Uh, <laughs> so in terms of like studying all these kind of genetic mosaics that you've been building to study the uh, the uh, specific like uh, cytoplasmic domain, um, I was wondering what's the differences across uh, if you use a heterolog synapse assay or um, uh, like a ex vivo like a uh, neural neural culture assay versus also you have the in vivo studies. What's the general congruency that you can actually observe across all those? Are they always agree in terms of like, for example, the uh, AMPA receptor and MDA receptor response? Um, is there any disagreement that can happen and how we can actually interpret those? Yeah, good questions. Um, we see the same effects in culture. And many of the experiments that I showed were in fact in culture as indicated on the slides. So these, I, we believe that what I've told you is basically fundamental cell biology of synaptic connectivity. Um, so there's correspondence between culture and in vivo. What we would love to have is a reconstituted system that is simpler than a culture, which is really very, very complicated because you have glia there, you have everything there, where we could potentially reproduce this type of regulation. We don't have that at present. And we would love to get there because that would allow us to actually figure out and better understand how it really works. Yeah. So I want to thank all of you for coming today. I want to thank Tom in particular for, for making the trip here. It's really great to be back in person. And our next phase is to go massless. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. That's just fine. Okay.